Hello all Royal Rangers, my name is Commander Matthew Kenslow and I'm over here in the United States of America and I've been a Royal Ranger for 20 years and year number 7 as a commander. Thank you so much for checking out this video. The purpose of this video is to go over a merit. In these videos I'm going to walk through every one of the requirements. Now it's important to note that while watching these videos it will not give you the merit. You have to show to your commander that you have watched and learned from these videos. What I recommend you doing is taking down notes for each requirement and then show them to your commander for approval. Some of the purposes of Royal Rangers is to build knowledge, wisdom, skills, and leadership attributes while learning about God's Word and conserving His resources practically. And most importantly, to have fun doing it. So I'm Commander Matthew Kenslow from the United States of America and be blessed. Hi everybody, welcome to Ropecraft where we're going to learn about rope such as natural fiber ropes and man-made synthetic ropes. We're going to be learning about the care of ropes and we're also going to be learning about basic knot tying skills. Knot tying is extremely beneficial to know. You need to know how to tie the right knots for the right purposes. Knot tying requires a lot of practice and patience. It's okay if you don't get some of the knots right away, but through perseverance and not giving up, knot tying will become easier and easier. In the videos, I'm going to try and explain how to tie knots the best I can. In order to do so effectively, I'm going to have to show you the parts of the rope to make it easier to explain how to tie the knots. I also recommend you having one or two pieces of rope while you watch this video and work along with me. Once you've mastered the knot, Show it to your commander from memory, and then your commander will sign it off. I would like to explain the difference between a knot and a tangle. A knot is something that is done properly, it's fairly easy to tie, and it's fairly easy to untie. When you don't know what you're doing, and you're just putting all these loops and tucks and turns all together and hope it works, that's called a tangle, and they're not really reliable difficult to untie. I've taught rope craft for so many years at my Royal Rangers outpost and even a classroom filled with second graders a couple of times at the local elementary school and it's always always easier if I go over the parts of the rope first versus if I don't. So that's why this part is important. There are two ends of a rope. The working end and the standing end. It doesn't matter which one is which, but whichever one you use to work with and build knots is called the working end. The working end is also known as the running end. This part is called the working part. The other part just stands there, and therefore it's called the standing part. And the end of the standing part is called the standing end. Sometimes you're going to have two running ends, like in the case of the square knot, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Okay, what you have here is called a bite. Notice that the working end does not cross over the standing part. Otherwise, it would be known as a loop. As long as it's like this, it's called a bite. Talking about loops, if the working end is over the standing part, it is called an overhand loop. When the working end is under the standing part, it's called an underhand loop. Let's talk about motions. When I go like this, this is called a turn. Another way I could use the turn is when I'm turning over the standing part like this. When I fit the working end through the eye of the loop, for example, that's called tucking. So this is tucking the working end through the eye of the loop. Whenever I do something like this, this is called a twist. Now, if you make two twists on a bite, this is called the elbow. When the rope goes like this, this is called a turn. 
Okay, now if the rope goes all the way around again, this is called a round turn. And when it goes around another time, this is called two round turns. Now let's talk about different types of knots. Bends typically tie two lines together. Hitches basically tie rope to things such as poles or stakes. Some knots have a purpose to be slip knots. Loops. Sheep shanks, especially the main sheep shank like this, shorten the rope or isolate a bad part of the rope. Stopper knots stops the end of the rope from coming through something like an eyelet or a grommet. And finally lashing, which is actually a merit by itself that you might take after this. Lashing uses ropes to tie things to things such as these two poles. Since we just finished talking about the parts of the rope, let's now talk about the two different types of ropes. We have natural fiber ropes, which are these. This is manila. This is sisal. There's others like hemp and cotton. And there are synthetic rope like these. And we're going to be talking about the difference between the two and the advantages and disadvantages in each. And whether you have natural fiber ropes or synthetic fiber ropes, we've got to learn how to care for them properly and we will talk about that as well. Here are natural fiber ropes up close and as you can see they are a little prickly to work with but these have their advantages. I want to take a moment and explain something extra between twisted and braided. If you could look closely, the strands of the rope have just been twisted together. In the process of making this, it made it strong. This one on the other hand is braided as you could see that the strands of this one is interwoven meticulously. And the same exact thing could occur with synthetic ropes. Here are some advantages of having synthetic rope. They're strong, they're durable, they last long, and it's pretty rare for them to rot and become brittle. Synthetic rope comes in different varieties. For example, you have nylon and polyester, as well as polypropylene and polyethylene. Nylon and polyester are very common, but they also have their advantages and disadvantages too. They're both strong, they're both synthetic, but nylon is elastic, which means that it stretches easily, unlike polyester. Polyester is more um, relatively rigid. When you tie knots in nylon rope, uh, it stays strong. But if you try tying knots with polyester rope, you could tie knots, but it tends to unravel or untie itself just a little bit. Uh, and that's due to uh, the properties of the polyester rope. Uh, the other two, uh, uh, all I know about polypropylene is that it's almost impossible to tie. Um, I found out the hard way uh, a friend at Royal Rangers who later became a commander four years ago um, gave me a mission to tie a 3 by 3 giant tic-tac-toe grid. I was up for the challenge and he gave me polypropylene rope and when I tied the knot it just unraveled itself. No matter how hard that I pulled both ends of the knot to get it to stick, it just wouldn't stick. It would always loosen itself and become very loose. So needless to say, the next two tic-tac-toe grids that I made, I used a different, easier rope. And let me say this, nylon is about four to five times stronger than natural fiber ropes. But let's think about this. If nylon is elastic and stretches easily, it could perhaps be good for things like towing. But if polyester isn't elastic like nylon, and is more rigid, relatively speaking, then it's good for tying down loads and to trust that rope over nylon. Nylon also isn't good in wet conditions uh, versus polyester. So if you're working in marine conditions or conditions around water, uh, then uh, polyester is the better choice. Here's some disadvantages of synthetic rope. You don't want to expose these to very, very extreme high temperatures because that would destroy the rope. You also don't want to put them out under the sun for too long because of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So these are very vulnerable to high temperatures. Plus, the uh, surface of synthetic ropes are relatively smooth 
compared to um, uh, natural fiber ropes. So because of the smoothness and less friction uh, with synthetic ropes, knots may tend to slip. Now let's collectively talk about natural fiber ropes. These could get quite prickly, so it's probably recommended that you wear gloves when using uh, certain natural fiber ropes. Not all of them are prickly. But these aren't really elastic, which could be good if you're tying down a load. Just like synthetic ropes, don't leave these out in the sun because the harmful radiation could really damage the rope. And also keep in mind that when natural fiber rope is wet, it usually swells and then it starts to rot and become brittle and all that. So if your rope is wet, don't just, you know, like put it on the ground and just let it soak in a pool of water. You want to hang it and let it drip dry. Just let it drip dry first before you coil it and make sure that it's dry before you start to use it again and trust it for for knots and things. And this segues into the next requirement, how to care for rope. Whether it's natural fiber ropes or synthetic ropes, you want to make sure that you properly care for it. And that's what we're going to talk about in this requirement and the next couple of requirements. We're going to learn how to properly coil rope, how to uh, fuse the ends of synthetic ropes, and how to whip the end of natural fiber ropes uh, to give it uh, the proper care. I've already alluded to some of the care in the previous requirement, including don't let uh, rope sit out in the sun and be exposed to the harmful rays of the sun or intense heat. And I also said that if rope gets wet, don't let it just sit there um, hoping that it would dry. Again, let it drip dry. If you have any knots in the rope, make sure that you always unravel the knots before storage. There are also special products out there that will help you clean ropes the safe way. But make sure that it's completely dry before you either coil it for storage or use it again to build knots. This should go without saying, but don't step on the rope because that will damage it. Before we move on, the advantages and disadvantages to both a natural fiber and synthetic rope, as well as the care for the rope, uh, what I've given you is just, you know, a list of some of the things. Um, it's not all-inclusive, and you could uh, further research more ways to properly care for a rope, and more ways if you're choosing uh, what type of rope that you want. Um, there's, you know, more to it than what I just said. Here's how you properly coil a rope. I'll show you a couple of methods. We need to know this because we need to know how to properly store rope so that we could use it in the future without having it, you know, all, you know, bent and everything. Because rope, especially synthetic rope, has a memory. And if you have a knot in here, or if you just crumple it up like this and just throw it in the locker, then it's probably going to develop a memory and then it would almost be useless. When I first learned how to coil a rope, the person who taught me uh, said that you take your hand and you go down the rope like this, you bring it up, and you coil around. But as you coil and make a loop, you give it a little twist. You see how if I don't have it twisted, it sort of kinks like that. If I twist it, then it brings it right back up. Okay, but there's an easier method. So I would start by taking my rope like this in my right hand, and then I would take start up here and grasp the rope with my hand and slide down and go turn under my uh, elbow and then go all the way back up to my hand. Now, as I do this, I'm going to keep it taut and tight. I'm not going to let it loose like this. I'm going to keep it tight. And as I do so, I'm going to make twists all the way around. I'm going to give that little twist to prevent it from having a kink inside. And I'm going to keep on going all the way around. Now, once I have about this much left, I'm going to carefully take my arm out and you see there's no crisscross or figure eights anywhere in here so there's no kinks which if you by any chance have any 
then you might need to go back and remember to twist as well. Now, I'm going to take this excess here and I'm going to start coiling the other way from the top down, like so. And I'm going to do that for about three or four times, depending on how much excess I have. This is about nice. So I'm going to right now take the excess and form a bite. I'm going to tuck it through all the way through, pull it out, the bite, but I'm not going to pull out the working end here, and I'm going to fold the bite in on itself over the coil and just let it drop there. And then I just take uh, this working end here, I just pull down. That is one way to properly coil a rope. And you could just hang it on a nail. So here's the second method of coiling a rope. And this time I'm going to be using a synthetic rope. I'm going to start just like before. And instead of taking this and just wrapping it around in a coil like before, instead I'm going to take this excess right here and I'm going to bring it up ideally where uh, where this end is at the bottom of the coil so essentially I formed a big long bite right here now I'm going to keep my index finger on top right here and I'm going to uh, turn the bite over my index finger and pull it through like this Next, I'm going to take the bite, I'm going to turn it upward, and I'm going to remove the index finger. I'm going to tuck this where the index finger was. And I'm just going to pull and tighten, like that. This by itself will not stand as a coil, so I'm going to make one more wrap around. I'm going to put my index finger back on top, I'm going to wrap over it, And then I'm going to take the bite, and as you probably guess, I'm going to remove the index finger. I'm going to feed or tuck this bite through the second wrap, and I'm just going to pull upward, and there you go. Depending on the rope and all that, uh, this may be shorter. It all depends on when you begin. Uh, it does kink because it's synthetic rope, so it's more prone to uh, kink as well, but those are the two uh, main methods of coiling a rope. Here's how you whip the end of a natural fiber rope. Here I have a manila rope, and whipping does not mean to whip with the rope. It just means to properly care for the end of a rope. Do you see how the three strands are starting to unravel like this? Well, it's going to continue to do so, making use of this rope nearly impossible, or at least very difficult. So, how do you fix this? Well, you need to whip the end of the rope. Here's how you do it. Take a small piece of string like this, small in diameter. So, the first step is that you take the string and you form a bite. Next, place the bite over the end of the rope, making sure that the open end of the bite is closest to the end of the rope. Now I'm going to use my thumb to hold that in place as I start to make the first couple of turns, like so. And I'm keeping this end here out on purpose, and you'll see why in a, in a few moments. Now as I keep on wrapping around and around notice that the rope that the string is neither crossing over the previous wraps nor is it being too careless okay rather each wrap 
is adjacent to the one previous to it. I'm going to keep on doing it until I run out a string. Now I'm going to tuck my string through the byte like this and just leave it there. This is where this end comes in. Now I'm going to pull this end like so. And the string that I tuck through the byte keeps it from coming apart. That is how you whip the end of the rope. You would cut off the ends of the string and the rope as you cut it very close to here and now you have a secured end that won't unravel. Here's how you fuse the end of a synthetic rope. Do you see how it's beginning to fray or unravel? This will make knot tying difficult to almost impossible. Take a look at this. This is what could happen. So here's what you do. You take a firm grip of the rope toward the end that needs to be fused together. You're keeping a, a bit of distance away from the end. And you take a torch or a match and you fuse the end of the rope together. As you do so, you're making a twisting motion. If there's any sparks, you'll just blow it out. And that's how you do it. That way it won't unravel anymore. Here's how you make the figure eight knot. You make an overhand loop like this, and then you take the working end and you turn it over the standing part like this. And then you bring it up and you're going to tuck it through the eye of the loop that you made and then simply you're just going to pull. And that is the figure eight knot. If you're curious about an alternate way, make a bite and then perform two twists to make an elbow and you take the working part and you tuck it through the eye of the loop and just pull. Figure eight knots could be used as stopper knots. So let's say that you want to hang a clipboard with a piece of rope. You would put the rope through and then you would just simply tie the figure eight knot and if you notice it's not going anywhere. It stops the rope from coming all the way through. Hence the name stopper knot. Same thing with the simple overhand knot. The figure eight knot could also be used for arts and crafts as well. Here's something that I made for leather craft several, several years ago. Let's say that you're putting twine through beads and you're making a design and you have all these beads that you're putting on top of each other. Well, to prevent them when you're done from just coming out, you could just tie the stopper knot and it will stop them from coming out. Here's something extra called the figure eight loop. You take the rope and you form a bite. Make sure it's a long bite and then just simply make a figure eight knot and you have a loop right here. Here's how I tie the square knot. Both ends are going to be a working end. Here's the right side and here's the left side. It's very important to make that distinction. The okay, right goes over the left and you're going to take it, make a turn like so. You're going to turn down first and then you're going to turn up and then give yourself some slack. Alright, you have the right side now and the left side. This time, the left goes over the right and you do the same exact thing. You make it turn down, you tuck it through, you come up, and just pull. And that is the square knot. It's one of the first knots I've ever learned in Royal Rangers. An easy way to untie it is you need, need to break the knot. You just take one of the ends and go like that. This is called the capsized knot. 
or li little trivia and then you just pull it out just like that now here's what you don't do so here's right and right goes over left I'm going to turn down then turn up give myself slack here's what you don't do don't do right over left again if you do so this is how it would turn out and you have something called the granny knot and it's really not a stable knot to have the square knot isn't really a stable knot so you don't really want to use it to join two lines but you could use it for first aid you could use the square knot to tie off a bandage here's another application to the square knot let's say that you want to have a whistle around your neck well you would probably use a longer piece of rope but here's how you would do it you would fit one end of the rope through the key ring and then you would just tie a simple square knot and there you go here's how you tie the clothes a clothes is a knot that could be tied around a cylindrical object like a pole a strong tree branch a dowel whatever you're tying to here's how you tie it you take the working end of the rope and you turn it round about the pole and give yourself plenty of slack. For beginners, place your index finger above the first graph. Next, take the working end, turn it round about the pole, crossing the first graph and your index finger. Okay. Next, take the working end, turn it round about upward, remove the index finger and in place of it, Tuck it through, making sure that the third wrap is on the right to the first wrap, so that the third wrap does not cross over the first wrap, and just cinch it down. This is the clovage, it is the starter knot to all lashing, which again is a merit uh, by itself. A neat trick that you could do to tie the clovage is prepare the rope first with two loops and then slide the pole through the loops. Allow me to explain. First, make an underhand loop. The working end is underneath the standing part. Now, make a second one. A second underhand loop. Now you put the second underhand loop over the first underhand loop and then Simply you take the pole and just tighten and you have a clothage. You could do the same thing with overhand loops, but instead of putting the second overhand loop above, you put the second overhand loop underneath the first overhand loop and you'll still get a clothage. Here's how you tie the sheet bin. The sheet bin is used to join two lines together typically of uneven diameter. So here's how you tie it. You take the thicker rope in your undominant hand and form a bite. So I'm right-handed, so I'm holding it with my left hand. Next, I take the other rope, and I'm going to come from behind, and I'm going to go tuck it through the bite, pull it up, and while you're uh, a beginner at this, I would wrap the second rope around my index finger like this. Essentially I'm forming a turn and now I'm going to turn up the working end and I'm going to tuck it through here. I'm not going to tuck it through here otherwise I'll get a square knot. I'm going to tuck it through here and then I'm just going to carefully pull and that is the sheet bin. That's how you, you join two lines together. Now, to make it stronger, you could do something called the double sheet bin. And that's when you do another turn. Just like this. The double sheet bin. Here's how you tie the bowling. You take the rope, and you start by making an overhand loop. The working part is over the standing part. Next, form a bite with the working end. 
and then you take the working end, you tuck it through the eye of the overhand loop, and then you wrap it around the standing part like this. Next, you tuck it back through the eye of the loop, and finally you pull and tighten. A great mnemonic or memory device to help you remember how to tie the bowline in once you have the overhand loop is to imagine the working end as the head of a rabbit or a snake. For instance, the snake comes out of the hole, around the tree, whereas the standing parts of the tree, and back through the hole. And then just tighten. And there you have the bowline. The bowline is a, a great non-slip knot. It's very secure. Here's how you would tie the bowline around things like trees or poles. First, start with the overhand loop, but before you tie off the rest of the bowline, you go around the object that you're tying, and then you just do everything as before. The snake comes out of the hole, around the tree, and back through the hole, then you pull, and there you go. What makes the bowline a secure knot is that it's a fixed knot. It's not like the top line hitch or the uh, two half hitches. It's not adjustable. You can't adjust it. And that's a defining feature of the bowline. So that's why it's also good to tie around people in emergencies because if you tie something that's unfixed and adjustable, it may really squeeze and hurt the person that you're rescuing. If you're interested, I have a tutorial of how to tie the bowl in a faster way, something that my grandfather taught me, something that he picked up when he was in the Navy. Here's how you tie two half hitches. Take the rope and turn it around the pole. It could be a horizontal pole or a vertical pole. Make sure that you have plenty of slack. Now, take the working end and place it underneath the standing part, essentially forming an underhand loop. Then you take the working end and turn it and tuck it through the eye of the underhand loop. Okay, next step is do exactly the same thing. So you take the working end, put it underneath the standing part, like so, and then take the working end, turn it around tuck it through the second loop you made and then just pull it together and there you go, two half hitches. Uh, the purpose of the two half hitches um, is general. It's used for a lot of things, um, especially tying rope to things like poles or trees or masts on ships. The reason why it's called two half hitches is because when we went around the pole and then form an underhand loop and then tuck the working end through the eye of the loop. This is known as a half hitch. And a half hitch cannot stand on its own, so you need to have two half hitches in order to get something that will stand. I want you to take note of something that we did. Here, I said we turn around the pole, and then we place the working end underneath the standing part. Well, you could have also put it above the standing part making an overhand loop, and then take the working end, tuck it through the eye of the loop. The only thing is that if you start by going over the standing part, you have to do it again. So take the working end, go over the standing part, tuck it through, that is still two half hitches. I want to show you an application of using a half hitch, or for better measure, two half hitches. Let's say that I'm tying a mooring hitch. Since that's not part of Royal Rangers, I'm not going to go over the derivation. But if you want to learn how to tie it, then I have a tutorial in the card above. The mooring hitch is fairly stable, but not 100%. The caveat is this end right here. Just one pull and the entire hitch is gone. So one way out of that is to simply tie a half hitch. Take the working end, put it through the loop, and then you tuck it back in on itself, and 
there you go. And for good measure, you could do it again. And form two half inches. And thus, it's not going anywhere. Here's how you tie the top line hitch. The top line hitch is very similar to the two half hitches, just one extra step. It could be tied over a horizontal or a vertical pole. It could be tied uh, to a stake to secure a tent, which I'll get to uh, here momentarily. Take the working end of the rope and turn it around the pole like this. And make sure you have plenty of slack. Just as in two half hitches, you place the working part underneath the standing part, forming an underhand loop. Then you take the working end, you turn it and tuck it through the eye of the loop that you made. Okay, now remember in two half hitches, you would just go down and around again. But this time, in the top line hitch, you're going to add one extra coil through the eye of the loop. So take the working end and just coil around the standing part, tuck it through so that the second coil is above the first coil. And just tighten. Now, just as in two half hitches, now you go down, form another underhand loop, and then take the working end, turn it up, and tuck it through, and then just tighten. And there you go. That's the top line hitch. Now, uh, the defining feature of a top line hitch is that it's adjustable. So watch this. I could adjust it like so, or I can make it tighter like so. And the purpose of the top line hitch is to decrease or increase the tension. And I'll show you an application to that right now. So here's an application to the top line hitch. I have my tent stake here. Let's say that this is the guy line and my tent right here. I'm going to tie the top line hitch just like I showed you on this tent stake. So I have my top line hitch right here. Do you see how loose this is? To change that, I just take the top line hitch and I adjust it to increase the tension. And make it tighter, make it taut like that. That's why it's called the taut line hitch. And uh, you could do this uh, for a tent. You could also do this for a small tree that you're trying to hold upright. You'll just do put like two, three, or four of these around the tree and uh, get it to stand. So here's an application to the taut line hitch. Now I want to teach you another application to the taut line hitch. To start tying the clothesline, you have two options. You could tie a bowl in or you could tie two half hitches. And I'm going to start by uh, tying two half hitches. Remember, two half hitches is a useful knot if you just want to tie rope around trees or poles. Now I'm going to run the rest of the line toward the other tree. To tie the rest of the clothesline, I'm going to pull the rope up. I'm going to tie the top line hitch around this tree. Okay, so as you can see, our clothesline isn't as tight or taut. It's loose right here. That's where the taut line hitch comes in to make it taut or to add the tension. So I'm just going to go like this. And there you go. You can make it as tight as you want. And now you have a clothesline. Now I want to teach you a strong, useful hitch called the trucker's hitch. The purpose of the trucker's hitch is to tie down a load for transport. If you're putting a lot of camp gear on top of a flatbed pickup truck or a minivan, uh, then the trucker's hitch is the hitch to go. It's very strong, but it's also easy to untie. To tie the trucker's hitch, you also have an option. You could tie two half hitches or the bowline. And to change it up a bit, I'm going to start with the bowline. Now I'm going to run the rest of the line toward the other tree. Next you need to tie a loop. So you could tie an overhand loop or you could tie the figure eight loop like I showed you earlier in this video. So let's make a figure eight loop. You make the bite and then you just tie 
the basic figure eight loop like this. Now since I have my loop, I'm going to wrap the rest of the working end around the tree. And then I'm going to take the working end, tuck it through the loop, and then cinch it the other way toward the tree. I'm going to make it nice and taut, very strong. And to get it to stay, I'm going to tie two half hitches on this side. So again, you could imagine tying this over a pickup truck or a minivan. Uh, you could imagine tying this um, between two trees and then put a tarp on it and then just tie down the tarp and that way you have a shelter. So that's how I tie the trucker's hitch. Now I want to show you a bonus knot. This knot used to be required and as of filming this it's not anymore but I still want to show it to you anyway in case they bring it back called the sheep shank uh, knot. And it's a very useful knot to know. Um, it's pretty simple once you get uh, the hang of it and uh, frankly you sort of need to know it uh, regardless especially if you're going to deal with rope as you get older in life. Notice here that uh, this rope has a couple of bad pieces to it. Let's make believe that these are weak spots or vulnerable spots of the rope um, and at any time it may snap so you may not trust it uh, with a load but you could fix it by this simple knot called the sheep shank. The sheep shank um, is to uh, shorten a rope if it's too long or in this case isolate the bad part of the rope and here's how you do it. It's easier to work on the table first. You could do it in midair but it's simpler if you do it on the, on the table. So have the rope like this in an S shape. So you're essentially forming two bites with a little bit hanging off on each end. Let's start over here. Take this working end and form a little overhand loop like this. What you're going to do is feed the right bite through this overhand loop. And then you're just going to give a little pull and keep it there. Now I want to show you something just so that you can be aware of it. When you form the loop, you need to uh, tuck the bite through, the, through its eye in such a way that it will tighten like this. Because if you don't, let's say, here's the overhand loop, let's say you come from behind, instead it's not going anywhere. On this side, form an upside down overhand loop. And just like on the other side, you're going to uh, feed or tuck uh, the left bite through that part, that side of the overhand loop. And then you just pull, and there you go. In effect, this only allows us to use the good part of the rope. You still have uh, this rope carrying a load. You have the top, you have the bottom, and you have the reinforced middle with not just one strand, but now like three strands. It's not really reliable if it's uh, loose. It needs to be taut. Otherwise, it will just come apart over time. Another way to tie it, technically, is just make a bite and then take the other side of the rope and just come from behind and just make a turn around and then as you turn you're just going to cross over and just tighten and then you'll just do the same for the other side. Here's a couple of quick things just for the leaders uh, just to give you some suggestions uh, you might have already thought about this but in my outpost and all the years of teaching rope craft uh, something that um, I thought of is having uh, the boys race, like who could coil uh, not necessarily the fastest, but the quickest efficiently. Like, not just, you know, 
putting like a random coil together but actually doing it right but still the quickest and another thing is uh, knot traces like when I go uh, through like the square knot for example or the sheet band or the bowlin after I'm done teaching and going over it a couple of times I have everybody raise their hand and say ready set go and they try and see who could tie the knot the fastest and accurately and also something else for you to consider um, maybe you could ask the boys how many of you think that you could tie a knot behind your back so big congratulations for watching this video and getting through the merit now remember it just takes a lot of practice and patience to get these down once you get it down just show the commander um, the knots the uh, how to coil um, how to care for the rope and just show your commander the notes and they should uh, sign you off so again good job